On a very fundamental level, science is a human endeavor to remove as much of our own personal beliefs as possible when we're trying to discern the nature of reality. In other words, when we're looking at evidence or making an observation, we figured out that people have predetermined beliefs and that these things end up frequently tainting those observations and those tests. So we get multiple people with presumably different biases and different opinions to weigh in on these things together. And then we can whittle out the things that seem to come from different camps of thought and that are just things that are generally agreed upon. Now, this doesn't always work. As a matter of fact, some areas are more tainted by humanity than others, but this is a human endeavor to remove humanity from our observation. So it is a little bit on the tricky side, but we do the best that we can. There are some areas, however, that are much worse about it than others, as longtime viewers of the channel will be well aware. The debate concerning the prehistory of humanity and a lot of the archaeology involved is extremely inflammatory. Lots of arguments, lots of different people getting crazy about this, with many of the debunkers engaging in some unethical behavior, all the way down to personal attacks and, well, outright falsehoods. Now, this does make it kind of difficult for those of us that are interested in archaeology, but are skeptical of the archaeologists to trust them, because we have learned that well, they don't always tell the truth, right? And this is kind of a sad thing, but it is the kind of thing that Electrician Dan can cry about until he's blue in the face. I am a lay person. They do not give two crafts what I think. But you hope that when scientists weigh in on this subject, that they would feel a little differently. They might look twice at it. So we're going to talk about a couple of papers that were published very recently. One of them is a, a paper about ethics regarding the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis, and the manner that many of the debunkers go about to debunk these. And the other one is discussing very specific data in a paper that was omitted in order to debunk that very same hypothesis. So let's talk about some science, guys. Hi, my name is Dan, and welcome to Debunking. Man, is it f***ing hot out here. That's more my temperature right there. But, but for those of you who are unaware, Mark Young, a geoarchaeologist, he recently posted an article that was addressing a paper that had debunked another paper. So yeah, this is kind of like Inception or any typical YouTube response stuff, right? Response to a response. But the first paper in the chain was supporting the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis. And for those who are unaware, it's basically the hypothesis that a comet or several fragments of a comet either hit or burst right above uh, the ice pack on the Northern Hemisphere about 12,000 years ago, creating a bunch of flooding, killing off most of the megafauna, which are creatures over 100 pounds, uh, potentially destroying the Clovis culture, changing the environment heavily, ending the last ice age, uh, it's basically an explanation for a phenomenon known as the Younger Dryas. It's an explanation for the ending of that whole thing and for the changing of time, basically, at the end of the at the end of Younger Dryas, at the end of the last ice age, when we lose things like the saber-toothed tiger and we come into a more modern uh, group of flora and fauna. So the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis is supported by several scientists, but it's also not supported by several scientists. And it is, it's hotly contested. There is no question about that. But Mark's paper, or Mark's article, excuse me, is addressing the fact that the paper, well, as he puts it, the paper is basically engaging in unethical behavior. I'll, 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 we'll just dig into it a little bit here. Now, this gets very technical, but the debate here hinges on isotopic levels of platinum and the proposed origins of it in the record. One thing important to note is the paper debunking the impact tacitly acknowledges the higher levels of platinum at the outset of the Younger Dryas, but doesn't accept any correlation to a possible impact. Instead, it claims five volcanoes over the course of 4,000 years deposited this platinum, something Mark claims is basically impossible. He shows that only three volcanoes are demonstrable in the record, and that even if four volcanoes were found to have erupted in that time frame, it wouldn't exclude the possibility of the fifth set of markers being from an impact. Now, a lot of this is highly technical, but one thing that Mark is very clear about, to the point that even a layperson can easily suss it, is that the amount of platinum that is found in the record has been artificially reduced by the omission of a data set here, 
so that they can not only cr have less platinum in the record, but kind of dull the spike and, and remove the highest point of it. And this comes right after Mark has blasted them for using really bad methodology. But here, I'll let Mark get into it. As if this catastrophic error was not enough, there is another, much worse issue concerning the data integrity of this paper. Close examination of the depth column in yellow, figure 2, reveals a consistent sample resolution of 1 to 2 centimeters throughout most of the section, except for one glaring anomaly. After 151 centimeter depth, there is an abrupt leap to 155 centimeters highlighted in blue, figure 2, that results in a gap of 4 centimeters. A sample from 153 centimeters would slot beautifully into this gap to complete the section and its absence is conspicuous. Because the conclusions of this paper are based on correctly interpreting the 151 centimeter sample, which sits directly above the missing 153 centimeter sample, its inclusion is very important. Perhaps we can learn something about the missing 153 centimeter sample from other investigations. Luckily, the Younger Dryas border at Hall's Cave was examined for impact proxies by the Younger Dryas border team back in 2009, figure 4. So what did they find? The study, led by Dr. Thomas Stafford Jr. in collaboration with the early YDB team and whistleblower against this study, found a discrete peak of nanodiamonds, magnetic microspherules, carbon spherules, and biomass burning proxies in the YDB layer at between 151 and 153 centimeters, figure 4. So here we have a precedent that the layer containing these proxies at Hall's Cave occurred between 151 and 153 centimeters. The presence of multiple impact proxies between 151 and 153 centimeters demonstrates that the YDB at Hall's Cave can be found at that depth. Of course, this was only the case for the specific samples taken from the 2009 study, as explained earlier, 153 centimeter depth is not the only possible location for the Younger Dryas border as the soil profile undulates. Basically, there's a whole layer that the debunkers just decided to omit from their data. Then that layer just happens to be one that undermines their position. Mark continues. Because Sun et al., which is the debunking paper, is ultimately devoted to testing the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, it is unconsciousable that the 153 centimeter sample was not included. So why is this important sample missing from the data set? Well, perhaps if they found a large platinum spike in their 153 centimeter sample, including it in their data set would have complicated their interpretation of the 151 centimeter sample representing the Younger Dryas border for the reasons stated above. This would render their conclusions entirely unsupportable. Now clearly this is a big deal, a group of scientists trying to undermine another group of scientists by the omission of data. Well, that ain't science anymore, buddy, is it? No, that's, that, I, you could, could, could call it dishonest. Um, you could call it pseudoscience, is what I always say. And as I frequently say, there's no point to debunk pseudoscience. I got two hands free with my new mic, haha. There's no point to debunking pseudoscience with more pseudoscience. You're, you're pissing up a rope. You're wasting everybody's time. I'm going to educate the public, and then you don't educate anybody. You just fill their head with more falsehoods. So, it's something that I don't like very much. And the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis is a freaking hotbed of this. It is constantly subject to these kinds of attacks that are not scientific in nature. For example, we had the recent paper, the refutation of the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis or whatever, and it's a comprehensive refutation, and you got all these different people on board saying so much goofy shit that, well, again, electrician Dan can cry about it all he wants, and well, they just ignore me, but another scientist, a geologist, jumped in on it, and, um, well, he had a couple of things to say. James Loris Powell is a geologist with decades of experience under his belt. He's nearly 90 years old now. Uh, he's very long in the tooth, but he's still sharp as a whip. In his recent paper, published in the Journal of Academic Ethics, titled Data vs. Derision, the Ethics of Language in Scientific Publication, the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis as a Case Study, we get numerous examples of the unscientific manner the debunkers have conducted themselves with. 
including the clearly divisive language employed in their published works. You know, right out the gate, Powell starts with, Throughout the history of science, novel ideas that diverge from the mainstream thought have often been met with condemnation, derision, and ad hominem attacks. These reactions have sometimes led to the premature rejection of such ideas, only for them to be later revived and even accepted as the prevailing paradigm. While robust debate is essential in science, the use of derogatory language is unethical, for it discourages research on existing hypotheses, detours funders, corrupts the scientific record, and delays or prevents the advancement of science. In this article, I discuss the case of unethical language repeatedly used against proponents of the hypothesis that is an extraterrestrial impact event triggered the Younger Dryas Cool period. He doesn't hold back, does he? And he includes a number of quotes from other scientists who have condemned this sort of behavior before, including this quote from Carl Sagan. Science requires an almost complete openness to all ideas. Ad hominem arguments, arguments about the personality of someone who disagrees with you, are irrelevant. Powell makes a case for these people being pseudo-skeptics, that is basically a fake skeptic, someone who considers an ideology more important than the actual evidence and actual skepticism. And I think that's a great term, actually. It's one that I would like to see employed even more, but I would point out, this is still pseudoscience. When these guys say things that are factually incorrect, that's pseudoscience, okay? When they omit data, that is pseudoscience. Now, they might not be pseudoscientists. They might not do this in general, but when they step outside of their normal work and they decide to play debunker, it seems like these guys have a hell of a time not doing the very things they rail against and doing it wrong, just not doing things right to the point where people on the outside can look in and see it, man. You don't even have to have a degree in this shit to look in and be like, dude, you guys are not playing this game right. And then the people that do have degrees that happen to look in, boy, do they get to swing some hammers. And there's just so much of this crap going wrong. I'll, I'll let Powell continue. He summarizes one paper with the following. Citations 15 through 17 in Pinter et al. refers to three books on the pseudoscience titled, respectively, Pathological Science, The Undergrowth of Science, Delusion, Self-Deception, and Human Frailty, and Voodoo Science, The Road from Foolishness to Fraud. These books use as examples of pseudoscience UFOs, cold fusion, perpetual energy and motion, extrasensory perception, eugenics, the Jewish physics of the Nazis, oh boy, homeopathy, the works of Deepak Chopra, animal magnetism, and more. It could not have been more clear that Printer et al. were labeling the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis as pseudoscience without coming right out and saying so. Opponents would do that in the next article we review. You know, I can't help but smile when I read this guy's paper. It's he really is a savage when it comes to this stuff. He pulls zero punches. He is very much like, it makes me feel a little vindicated because a lot of the stuff I've been saying as a layperson, this guy's saying as a scientist, it's old enough to be my great grandpa. Well, my grandpa. <coughs> Whew. Speaking on the comprehensive refutation paper, he had this to say. In several places, Holiday et al. used the term pseudoscience in relation to the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis titling one section, More Pseudoscience, Fringe Evidence, and Conjecture. Elsewhere they write, The YDIH evolved directly from pseudoscience, and although Firestone et al. paper did not contain all the pseudoscience of its predecessors, dot, dot, dot. Another section is titled, Pseudo-Archaeological Divined Date of the Impact Event. Accusations of pseudoscience should not appear in a peer-reviewed article without solid and clear evidence to back them up. Now it's clear to even a dumbass electrician like me that calling a scientific hypothesis pseudoscience is poisoning the well. It's the kind of tactic I would expect to see from a journalist or a tabloid or a YouTuber, but not from a scientist, all right? And that's, that's the thing here. This is coming in scientific journals. This isn't coming on YouTube videos. This isn't on the Joe Rogan podcast where you can get away with... This is in a fucking journal. So when you misrepresent data or call people names <laughs> outright, just you just hurl ad hominems around, you're violating a fundamental tenet of the scientific method, period, end of story. 
Fundamentally, that is flawed. We are not. Scientists are not supposed to do that. Dan is an outsider. As Again, as somebody who's a YouTuber, yeah, you can throw rocks all day long and say, these guys are a bunch of fucking blah, blah, blah. But the ones that are doing the science, they're not supposed to engage in that sort of behavior in their papers. They can go on YouTube and do it as suppose they want. But that, how that might affect the perception of them as a professional is on them. But doing it in a scientific paper is grotesque, all right? Point blank, it's grotesque. If you're going to call something pseudoscience, you better have not just, I think, or I can prove I th that this may be. No, you really need to just hammer it. If you're going to call it pseudoscience, you need to fucking prove that one. Otherwise, you are engaging in kind of professional slander and stuff. And I don't want to go down the whole legal road. I'm talking about that. It's just bullshit. All right. It's the kind of thing that's unscientific. It's the kind of thing that makes me rail against a lot of the people that are on team science. How many times have I been told, you need to listen to the scientists on this? How many of you guys out there that are debunkers know fuck all about geoarchaeology, but you're going to tell Mark Young that he's wrong because he disagrees with you and he's part of the Comet Research Group. Therefore, he's part of the wrong team. Well, you don't think that some of us see the debunkers in the same light, especially when they start saying things like Carl Fegan's recently misrepresenting the olive trees or Flint Dibble. Let's not even talk about all the things that that guy liked to misrepresent to millions or right freaking here. Misrepresentation in these papers where they're like, well, better not include that data set. That might just fuck our whole narrative up. Guys. You cannot claim to be team science, and certainly cannot claim to be like, you need to follow scientific authority when you, th this is what's going on. It's a hot mess of ridiculousness. At the end of the day, the scientists are the ones that are damaging the name of science, as I've said before. And also at the end of the day, these guys are engaging in the very definition of of pseudoscience, of pseudoscepticism. These, this is fake science. This is fake skepticism. They're not including all, all the data. They're not attacking the papers, the papers properly. Well, they, they come at them and say, "Oh, this is this is a bunch of pseudoscientific bullshit." That is not how you debunk a paper. You address it on the merits of its data alone. When they start using language that poisons the well, it says one thing and one thing only. These guys are not doing it scientifically.